A302, I'm Jackie Ferris. This week, we're going on a treasure hunt at the Biggs Museum of American Art, where we find out exactly what's coming out of the vault. Get ready to be fascinated. The 302 is headed your way. There are a lot of surprises coming up at the Biggs Museum. I'm joined now by curator Ryan Grover to talk to us a little bit about some of those surprises all being brought together. Something that's old is new again in a new form in a show called Out of the Vault. Talk to me a little bit about the concept behind what you've put together here. We had a little bit of empty space up here on the third floor um, and it gave us a chance to bring out of our object storage objects that we had been collecting pretty voraciously for the past 15 years or so, but we don't really usually get to focus or feature on them very much just because we just don't have the gallery space. So the third floor is divided up into different rooms and different themes. And the first one when you walk in is contemporary realism. What exactly is contemporary realism? You know, when you think about modern art, we think about art of the 20th century, art of the 21st century, we often think about abstraction. We think about the ways that artists have sort of simplified their view of the world to emphasize color, to emphasize forms, to shapes, um, whatever, the, whatever the sort of um, um, sort of individual little subject that they want to kind of focus upon. Um, realist artists on the other side are kind of create this sense of balance. They have continued to try and picture the real. They've tried to continue and portray the things that we can identify, fully formed subjects. So portraiture and landscape and uh, figure studies and fully developed subjects that are um, integrated with both those formal elements as well as sort of narrative and subject matter. So it's kind of like a one foot in two different areas. Well, that's kind of the 20th century in a nutshell. We have individual artists that are going in um, in formal experimentation, so experimentations about the form of art, and then we have other artists that are sort of continuing with a very modern feel, uh, very traditional subjects like uh, figure studies and portraits and things of that nature. One of the first pieces that jumps right out at you when you walk into the first room is vertigo. It's so beautiful and colorful. Can you tell, tell us a little bit about that? So the work was uh, purchased from a competition that we did here at the museum called, uh, let me think of it, I think we called it Big's Body. It was the first time that we had done a, a jury competition. So we invited artists from all over the Mid-Atlantic region to come and show their works here at the museum about representations of the human body. And it could be something as simple as portraiture or something as complex as talking about the negative space around bodies that don't ever become the subject of artwork. So it could be really just anything. And um, and his was the piece that the juror selected as the winning, uh, winning artwork from the competition, and we purchased it for our permanent collection. When you look at it, the first thing that came to my mind was sign language because of the hands um, kind of placed over um, the, the face. Um, do you hear the stories behind the inspiration, especially for a piece like this? Um, the artist Scott Hutchinson, I did not go into specifics with him about what he was thinking about with this work, but it seemed to me that he was really interested in developing um, a sort of hybrid image of different characteristics of the body. So the face is really um, a, a big part of this image. But then, like you pointed out, those beautiful hand gestures that become kind of almost a hair treatment or sort of a, uh, a shape around the head, a kind of halo of hands, if you will. Um, there, that, that sort of duality between head and hands seemed to be something that was really emphasized there. And I didn't know if that necessarily meant that he was talking about um, uh, what 
individuals are capable of doing with their hands or what they are, uh, if there was some sort of kind of magic that he was trying to represent. I'm not exactly certain. Sometimes uh, his work, when you look on his website, is uh, much more traditional, uh, but then sometimes they get into these sort of hybrid forms that are really, really imaginative. And that's the beauty of any time you look at any kind of art, is the artist may try to tell you something or tell you nothing, but you interpret interpret something just because that's the thing about art. It makes you think. Absolutely, absolutely. And again, that comes back to the 20th and 21st century is that um, artists are sort of opening the door a little bit and they let you fill in all of the answers. Another one of the pieces that is really remarkable is um, the gentleman with the sand. He's like drawing in the sand and you see his hand and it's like he's just about to start another line. Tell me about that painting. That is by an artist named Lisa Bartolozzi. It's called Scratching in the Earth, if I remember correctly, and or Scratching in the Dirt, maybe. And um, we purchased that painting to honor a former board member who had literally fallen in love with the artist and her work. Uh, she uh, paints very, very slowly. She uses um, time-honored methods of painting and these very, very thin layers of translucent oil paint. She paints in the way that Vermeer used to paint hundreds and hundreds of years ago, but she works in these very large scales. So it's really, really, we were very pleased to be able to bring that work into the museum. Um, but her work is all about, um, this particular work is from a series um, called the Wisdom Series, and it has biblical references, but it's really all about what people make, what people create, what people are able to um, uh, formulate, and the ways that that sort of points back to being human. Now you talked about scale. Whenever you go into the next room, there's a huge, it's really beautiful fawn. Talk to me about fawn. The painting fawn is by a guy named Willem de Looper. Um, in Washington, D.C., there was a group of artists called the Color School Artists. And they were uh, abstract painters, largely abstract painters, that were really sort of having a lot of fun with a new painting medium called acrylic paint. You've heard of oil paints, but acrylics are different because they can be diluted in water. And the Color School Artists really delighted in this idea of sort of free-floating pigments in suspended in water that they could then stain unprimed canvas with. So instead of actually laying down sort of a foundation layer, they would just have, they would treat canvas like textile and then they would stain it with these acrylic paints in all these vibrant colors and these wonderful sense of patterns. But they were really talking about almost, in a way they were almost sort of conceptually talking about the craft of painting. So fawn, when you look at it, is not of a fawn. It is not necessarily of the uh, verb to fawn over something, but it gives you, but those, the word fawn gives you impressions about what you're looking at. Really, the subject is not identifiable in any way, shape, or form. It's completely abstract. But Willem de Looper was really interested in color combinations. He was really interested in looking at the ways that colors sort of vibrated next to one another. And he was really interested in this idea of pouring, splattering, uh, soaking, walking across canvases with these pigments and what sort of impressions he might be able to leave. Using them in new ways. Exactly. Excellent. When we get back, we're going to talk more about Out of the Vault. This is Captain Jay Saff of the Delaware State Police, 12th generation Delawarean, and I'm all about the 302. Welcome back. We're at the Biggs Museum. We're talking about a new exhibition called Out of the Vault. And one of the biggest pieces that, you know, you just can't miss um, is the Machine 3. I can't believe that is all ceramic. I know, it's incredible. Um, I'm gonna to totally butcher the, butcher the swear because I don't speak French, but it's called trompe l'oeil. Um, it's basically French for fool the eye. And um, Victor Spinsky, a uh, former professor at the University of Delaware in their fine art department, was the guy who created Machine 3, and he specialized in trompe l'oeil ceramics. So ceramics that look like anything but ceramics. Um, they're not bowls or vases or things for flowers, but they are, in this case, 
place, he's recreating entire gears, um, like from an oil refinery or something. It's really remarkable. Yeah, when you look at it, it looks like it's made out of metal, but it's not. So I wanted to move um, on to social realism. What is that? Um, so social realism was a, a form of realism, like contemporary realism, but it was uh, really sort of came to the forefront in American art in the 1920s, maybe up through like the 1940s. And it encompassed a lot of the period around the Depression, um, a time when a lot of art critics were sort of moving away from abstraction and really wanting artists to focus on scenes from their own backyard, scenes that um, really represented the human population, the American people. People. And one of those would be the Henry Clay Village, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Bayard Burnt was uh, born and raised in Wilmington, Delaware, and he uh, even started, he even studied locally at the Wilmington Art Academy. And um, he, you know, from ex except for a small period of time that he was in Europe, he pretty much stayed in Wilmington for his entire life. Um, he opened up a art supply store and framing shop, which is still in existence, um, and um, his family is still kind of connected to it, but he just became a community center in himself of other artists. Um, and everybody knew him, everybody knew of Hardcastle's gallery, and, um, and he was this terrific realist painter. You know, he painted he could paint in Impressionist styles, and he did, and he did paint in slightly more modernist styles, um, but what he's probably best known for are, like with the village here, are these kind of somewhat elevated views of these historic scenes all over Wilmington. And the view that we're looking at is the area just around Hagley Museum, or what is now Hagley Museum, but he's capturing it really at around 1900. When you look at it, it's, I have to say, the colors, they're very soothing, uh, especially for the time. Um, is that an intentional uh, kind of thing to have soothing colors, the, the pastels, the, the mint color? Is that a, an intentional choice? Um, it depends on the artist and it depends, I think, on the work. He uh, painted a lot of snow scenes. He definitely painted a lot of, um, of images in winter. There's the, they are publicly popular, a lot of individuals like to collect them. Um, so you start to, so there, he definitely played in that palette. You know, the interesting thing that is, uh, that I love so much about that painting is the aqua, that sort of aqua color of the the the, the river as it, um, the Brandywine River as it uh, sort of flows through the scene. He used, he comes back to that aqua color over and over and over again. And it's interesting because I feel like he really, um, he sort of, he's a sort of a departure from, but really, really sort of tied to the uh, the tradition that was created by a guy named N.C. Wyatt, as well as his son, Andrew Wyatt, and then Jamie Wyatt. Um, N.C. Wyatt used that aqua color quite a bit. So I feel like maybe he was sort of play, paying homage to um, Wyatt in the, the, the adaptation of that bright aqua. Now I wanted to move into modernism and there's a really a gorgeous um, painting, Still Life um, with Iris in a Bowl. So first of all, tell us a little bit about what modernism is and then how it applies to this beautiful um, floral. Um, modernism is a term that we use today to just sort of describe uh, a, a, a period in art history. And um, it really starts in the, 18, the later 1800s, right in the middle of the, or right at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And modernism really kind of ends kind of at the end of the Industrial Revolution in like the 1960s, 1970s. So we talk about that hundred year period as modernism. Um, that said, it's really just the only thing that sort of connects all modernist artists is that they are reacting to modern life, this modern urban world that had developed in that late 19th, early 20th century. Um, but the ways that they do it are really uh, idiosyncratic, they're really, really specific, and they're also really, really interesting. The ways, um, so our modernist gallery here at the museum, we really played with different forms of abstraction and the ways that like Arthur Carls and the, um, the still life that you described, you know, he's not as focused on subject matter, not as focused on subject matter as a lot of the artists that we've seen up to this point. He's really much more interested in gesture. You can see his way that he's placing the brush against that piece 
piece of paper all over the surface. And he's really interested in color combinations, the violets next to the oranges, next to the white, and the sort of sense of rhythm that that creates in the eye. He, um, he's really emphasizing some things, and then he's de-emphasizing things like a full bouquet of identifiable flowers or even um, the proportions of those flowers to the bowl. Everything is kind of blown out of the way so that he can focus on a couple of interesting formal qualities. It's really gorgeous when you look at it because you can see the flower and then there's shapes. You don't know what's in the background, but it all just comes together to, I don't know, it kind of lifts the spirit, I'd it say. It definitely does. You know, artists have always sort of played with those combinations of composition and color to kind of, as you say, to lift the spirit. Um, but uh, some artists of the 20th century realized that they could do that and they didn't even really need a subject. They could just play with composition and color. Excellent. We're going to hear more when we return. Hi, this is Bill Petroni from Extreme Zone in Newcastle, Delaware, and I love racing with the 302. Welcome back. We're talking about all of the pieces in a new exhibit called Out of the Vault. And one that sticks out for me because I have a history with New Mexico is the New Mexico Church. Really beautiful terracotta against a beautiful blue sky. Talk mm -hmm. to me about that one. So that that work is in with our social realist uh, gallery. And, um, and out of social realism comes this interest in regionalism to be able to sort of talk about the regional, the, the distinctive characteristics of each of America's regions. And so the Southwest becomes a major, major subject in that, as does the Midwest, as does the cities um, like Chicago, New York, um, even Florida. There, you know, there are lots of different regionalist artists that are sort of focusing on um, social realism happening within their own backyards. And that's a perfect example of it. So I wanted to move to post-impressionalism. Um, which I didn't realize was a thing, but it's really gorgeous and you can kind of see, you identify it. If you don't know much about art, you look at um, in the month of June and you say, oh, that reminds me of Impressionist. You're totally right. It has that Impressionist palette. So it's those bright synthetic colors and, um, and it is really, really fixated on an impressionist kind of application of paint. So it's really interested in how the artist is pu um, putting paint down onto the subject. Unlike impressionism, it's not quite, uh, Henry Bainbridge McCarter, the artist of that work, um, he was not really focused on climate conditions. He was not really that interested in sort of capturing sunlight as it comes through a cloud on the surface of this garden space. Um, he is much more interested in creating a kind of textural rhythm on the surface of his canvas using oil paints. Um, and it implies gardens, it implies cemeteries. Um, this is sort of a commemorative piece for World War II, um, uh, from, and it is a scene in France. Um, but he is capturing those moments in an impressionistic spirit, but he's not necessarily worried so much about the, those climate conditions. He's really much more interested in sort of capturing symbols of that day and, um, and doing it with this bright and um, sort of emotionally complex color forms. So it's kind of like um, the beginning and the end of life, if you look at it with the cemetery and the garden all wrapped in one. So Very much so, almost as if that garden is sort of growing through the monuments of a cemetery. So you see the crosses, but they're almost sort of crowded out by new life growing into those spaces. So you mentioned the way um, paint is placed on the canvas. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that in terms of, you know, I'm looking at it and I see it's just like thick texture, small brush strokes. It's just really, but at the same time, it's a combination of color and light and dark. It's really, it's really remarkable. It almost sort of reminds me of sort of textile design in that he's really sort of creating this sense of pattern across the surface. Um, you know, 
During the 20th century, a lot of modernist artists were trying to find their own signature way of using the artistic media that they were trained to use. So um, uh, photographers would have their own aesthetic, painters would have their own aesthetic, and each aesthetic, each, uh, the art, each artist created an identifiable aesthetic that was different than their contemporaries. And, um, and a lot of that grew out of, at least for 20th century painters, a lot of that grew out of this impressionist movement that had preceded them in that interest in what brushes do you use? How long is your brush stroke? What kind of textures, what sort of shapes are you um, using with that paint on the surfaces? Um, and you see those things repeated because each one of those artists would kind of develop their own muscle memory of how to apply paint. It's really gorgeous. So to kind of take a swing in the total opposite direction, mm -hmm. cubism. Yeah. So what is cubism? So cubism is a 20th century movement in art. Again, it's a form of abstraction. It's a kind of simplification of the subject matter. Um, and it reduces forms, at least geometric cubism, reduces forms into geometric shapes. And sometimes when you're taking art classes today, you might be asked to do this. So instead of creating really naturalistic, rounded profiles of the face, you might be able to, or you might be asked to sort of uh, break those down into simple forms flat planes that intersect and that you identify each of those planes and assign them a different color or shade so that you know if they're bright light or if they're in darkness. Um, and it's just sort of a formal exercise to sort of get you looking at a subject in a very specific way. Well, some artists really focused on this idea of creating cubist form from the natural world around them in the 20th century. And one of those individuals that was really at the forefront of that locally was a guy named um, Edward Loper Sr. Um, he was kind of a self-trained artist, really came to prominence during the Depression. He was um, part of the Works Progress Administration, so WPA artist, and, um, and but then studied with aesthetics at the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia after the war and really just absorbed a lot about French modernism and was one of the great sort of um, teachers, art teachers of French modernism locally. He, in, he influenced generations of painters. And you can see that um, in the portrait of May Mafaco. May Mafco. Um, it was a girlfriend oh, of his from the 40s. So when you look at it, the color combination, it's really very intimate. It kind of draws you in. Very much so. That um, I think you're right, that sort of uh, the dark coloration, the the dark outlining of so many of the different forms, but also May Mafco's sort of gesture, sort of holding up one arm and then placing the other arm around that table that is sort of unfolded towards the viewer, kind of draws you in. It becomes sort of this intimate sort of, um, this sort of intimate relationship with her. It's great. It really is. And there's uh, no wonder that it is a, a masterpiece on display here. We really do. So if somebody wants to come and check out all of these beautiful types of artwork, um, how do they do that? Best thing is to make a reservation. Um, uh, we really encourage people to go to our website or give us a call and get your own time slot. Um, the museum here is pretty much on like a path, so you won't necessarily have to overlap with other parties if you're concerned about um, uh, if you're concerned about COVID. And you definitely want to take time and just sit with each of the paintings because they truly are a joy to see. Ryan, thank you so much for taking the time with us. Well, thank you so much for visiting. And we'll be right back. For more information on Out of the Vault, you can visit BiggsMuseum.org. That'll do it for this week's show. We leave you now with more artwork from the exhibition. Until next time, I'm Jackie Ferris. We'll see you on the 302.